Hey, everybody, we're back. And at this point in time, let's go see who those people are behind the curtain. So I would like to introduce to you Mike Sear from uh, Virtual Rail Fan, our Platinum Class Service sponsor, and as well as our production company, guys. Mike, welcome. John, good morning. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us on this morning. We appreciate it. Uh, listen, it's the least I could do, and, and I know you're behind the curtain <laughs> even now. Uh, but uh, listen, give me a little bit of background. Um, when did this all start for you? Uh, Berkshire Rail Fan actually started as a, a kind of a can we do it thing about uh, 11 years ago uh, in a little town called Folkestone, Georgia. Um, and yeah, we basically wanted to watch trains from home. And, uh, you know, we, uh, I got with, uh, my partner, Justin Cornell and said, do you think that's possible? And uh, sure enough, you know, we, uh, we made it happen. Uh, it, it wasn't easy. It, it's, it was certainly an uphill battle about 11 years ago. The, uh, the live streaming technology wasn't, uh, wasn't what it is today. So. A little sure. struggle getting off the ground, but uh, so far so good. Uh, but here right you now, are. With, what, is am I right? Over eighty cameras out there now. Yeah, uh, over eighty cameras uh, spanning four countries, including our partnerships. But we're primarily located uh, in the U.S. and uh, we've we've got another location here in Canada. With gosh, our our waiting list this year is is probably close to a hundred deep of of new locations waiting to come online. Wow. That's amazing. And, and uh, l let's also talk about uh, your um, entrance into the uh, Railroad Hobby Show. Uh, you've been around for obviously 11 years, and but we just hooked up kind of like two or three years ago. Is that right? I can't remember, honestly. Uh, yeah, actually, um, our, our custom, one of our customer support guys, Kevin Yutz, is, uh, he's been coming to the show for years and He's always said, you know, hey, you guys need to come to the come to the show. Um, so of course, <laughs> Thanks, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Massachusetts is actually home turf for me. Uh, I'm, I'm a Massachusetts native, and cool. uh, so it was great to get up there and see the show. And and you know, Kevin explained to it uh, explained it to us, you know, how big it was. And uh, you know, we, we had no idea until we walked in the show that first year. And 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 <laughs> let me just tell you, it was it was it was wow. Um, and so, um, you know, immediately we thought, well, there's got to be an audience for this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, maybe we can broadcast it. And so, you know, that the first year we came up with scale trains and we, uh, we did some of their product releases with them. Yes. I remember and then that. The, yeah. The next year after that, you know, we decided to set up our own booth and actually stream the show from our booth, which was huge success, uh, you know, with our members, uh, they loved it. And, uh, yeah, we were kind of devastated to hear that the show was canceled this year. So. Oh, God, that was the word I used too. It just, it just was awful. But I, I can remember when you were setting up the streaming camera uh, at last year's show, and I got to tell you, everybody in line with that camera, they were loving it because they were all in that uh, video. Uh, and and when when I was over to your booth to do a demonstration, you guys zoomed in for me, and I, I swear to God, you could read the numbers on one of the box cars on a on an HO scale layout about 50, 60 feet away. Uh, and I'm I'm dead serious. It was that quality. It was crazy. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of our cameras we we started off with. Uh, you know, our first cameras obviously didn't move, but uh, quickly we moved in our first uh, our first pan tilt zoom or PTZ camera. Uh, was installed in uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, about 2015, um, and that was you know that was something new to us. Obviously, a camera that we had control over that we could look around, we could follow the trains. So once we set that camera up and, and realized you know how successful that was, uh, we've got a ton of moving cameras now. In fact, most most new locations uh, will get a, a PTZ camera, and uh, those those cameras can be controlled. Uh, remotely, of course, either from from our location, but we have a team of uh, over a hundred moderators that keep our, oh, our wow. chats on YouTube family friendly. Yeah, you know, um, during, the, during our break, we were I was watching that one camera. I said that camera's following that train, and then and then yeah. uh, you were you were filling me in that there are all of those operators out there, moderators, what have you. Yeah, um, th this morning we were watching uh, Fort Madison, Iowa. And uh, Bruce Williams, one of our mods, um, he was the uh, camera operator for that, that particular moment that we were watching. Uh, and they all do a fantastic job, uh, you know, really putting up cameras and, uh, and, and, and whatnot is the easy part. It's the, the, the people. Um, 
you know, yeah. trying to keep a, a family friendly chat environment on YouTube has probably been, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we've faced. <laughs> and, you know, we've got this dream team of, of over a hundred moderators that, that are all volunteer based and they absolutely do a phenomenal job at keeping, wow. uh, keeping the peace. We call them the, uh, the blue army. That's cool. That's cool. Mike, what's going on uh, in the future? What's, what's, what's next for you folks? Uh, well, um, you know, I wish I had a standard answer for that, but literally it changes from day to day. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've got a bunch of new locations coming up, actually. Uh, we just uh, just installed two cameras down in uh, Tucson, Arizona, at the uh, Southern Arizona Transportation Museum. Um, Cocoa, Florida, our first camera on the Florida East Coast Railway. Yeah. And uh, we're looking at uh, our next uh, couple of spots, we're looking in Cordial, Georgia, uh, Alabama. We've got several wow. states that, uh, you know, that we're looking to get into and expand our footprint um, out west. So, um, you know, and a lot of our camera locations come from viewer suggestions. We get hundreds of emails a week uh, from our from our dedicated fans and viewers. And, uh, you know, most of our locations actually come from from those emails and we really appreciate it and of course cool. you know if you guys watching today you know all you amherst folks if, if you've got a an idea or, or a suggestion for a camera um you know shoot us an email to locations at virtualrailfan.com and uh you know we constantly monitor that and uh we'd love to hear from you guys so let me ask you a couple of additional questions mike because i know you want to get back to behind the curtain uh <laughs> What's the, what's the process of getting a location? So someone suggests something to you, then what do you do? Uh, generally, after we get a suggestion that we've identified and that's a, that would be a feasible location, the, the first uh, couple of things that we do, uh, first and foremost, is infrastructure. You know, we need to make sure the power is available. We need to make sure the, the correct internet speeds are available. And then, of course, the, the views. You know, um, well, in some locations, you might be able to get great, you know, great power, great internet sometimes the views are just not there. So, you know, we have to, unfortunately, you know, turn those locations down. Um, but uh, yeah, primarily it's, it's internet and, and power. And if, if the view is good, um, then we usually move forward. We'll send one of our team members out for a formal site inspection, take ah. a peek at the location, you know, kind of so figure out, scout out how many trains and such like, and, and things like that. So that, that's what makes a good location is the amount of traffic I would imagine. Right. Um, yes, traffic is, is certainly one component, but we've discovered over the years that not necessarily, it's not necessarily about the traffic. Um, you know, you've got some locations that are uh, lower traffic, but they've got some interesting stuff happening. Like, uh, for instance, in LaGrange, Kentucky, uh, the railroad runs literally right down the center of Main Street. And uh, it's a quaint little, you know, southern town, uh, you know, lots of antique uh, buildings dating back to the Civil War. And oh, cool. you know, the, the railroad is literally on Main Street. So if you're, if you're going down Main Street, LaGrange, Kentucky, um, you can look out of your windshield and see a, a headlight and that's a train coming <laughs> at you. Granted, they're, they're moving at 10 miles an hour. So you, you've got a moment or two to kind of figure out a plan and, and, and get parked and get out of the way. But another thing is, you know, with these webcams, uh, you know, we've seen our, our, our share of uh, interesting mishaps, you know, folks that don't quite get out of the way in time and, and get tangled up. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, luckily there, they're going pretty slow, but- uh, So tell yeah. me about the impact, uh, Mike, tell me about the impact that uh, YouTube has had on uh, on all of this. Oh, YouTube has been uh, phenomenal for us. Um, we started on YouTube in May of 2017 and uh, pretty much immediately, um, you know, within that first 96 hours of being on YouTube, you know, we had at one point, you know, when we first launched a stream, you know, there was 25 people watching. Everybody is in chat, super excited. Wow, you know, I wonder when we'll hit 50 viewers. I wonder when we'll, we'll hit 100 viewers. Uh, John, last month we had 17 million viewers from 220 countries around the world. Holy cow. That is great to hear. That is phenomenal. That, that is, that's amazing to me. That's great. So what's the, what's the favorite? What's the most popular? Um, right now, I'd say the two most popular locations, just in terms of viewership, is, is the camera that we saw earlier uh, in Fort Madison, Iowa. It's yep. actually hosted by uh, the Kingsley Inn. Um, so, you know, these, you know, these uh, cameras that, you know, that they go in also have an economic impact uh, in town. Um, you know, once we put the cameras up there in Fort Madison, um, the manager of the hotel said the phone started ringing off the hook basically immediately. So now they've got really? people coming to stay and, and watching the trains. And of course, oh, man. You know, That's when, they, great. when they, 
Yeah. And when they come into town, uh, you know, they're usually bringing family members, they're eating, they're sleeping, they're shopping. So, you know, there's an economic impact to the entire community when we come into town. Fantastic. Amazing. Hey, I'm going to let you get back. Mike, thank you so much, number one, for being a sponsor. Number two, helping us with this production. We literally could not have done it without you. So we really, really thank you guys. Shout out to all your troops, Kathy, all the guys, Justin, all those guys. And we really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, one thing is, is the, the team at Virtual Rail Fan, from our moderators to, you know, uh, the staff is just a uh, phenomenal team. I don't think you could ask for, for anything better. Um, great group of people to work with and a uh, huge shout nice. out to everybody this morning. You guys are doing a great job. I, and I don't think people realize that you are down. You're not here. You guys are down in Tennessee and, and, yeah. and some of the support for the zoom is in Virginia and there's guys everywhere. Yeah. Uh, we're located in uh, East Tennessee, right on the, uh, right on the great smoky mountains. Beautiful down here. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I, I definitely enjoy our weekend. Uh, our weekend trip once a year to Massachusetts. Uh, it's certainly good to get together at the show. You know, this year, obviously we couldn't do it, but we're doing it virtually and uh, we hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, we're, uh, well, I'm loving it. So, <laughs> so that's, that's part of the battle. And, and I'm sure a lot of people are as well. And, and, and we will definitely be seeing you uh, next year. We're, we're, uh, I, see, I see wonderful things continuing to happen with us and, and we'll have you back bigger than better never next year. Yeah, we're certainly looking forward to it. I'm ready for this pandemic to hit the road. Yeah, I, I, I need to, we all need to get vaccinated, not to start talking about that. But once we do, everything will uh, pretty much allow us to do the things we were doing in the past. Mike, one last thanks. Appreciate it. Obviously, I'll be talking to you throughout the day uh, and all day tomorrow. But I, I just want to let the, the folks know that you are, you are the big part of why this is happening. So thank you so much. Yeah, and we're uh, we're happy to do it. Now I'm going to sneak back to uh, you know behind the curtain, and uh, we'll continue the uh, continue the fun. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> definitely that. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. All right, we'll talk. <clears throat> bye bye. Well, guys, that 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 was a, a, a just a, a portion of what uh, what has happened. Um, I, I'll tell you, these are my new best friends. I, we have been on the phone. Oh gosh, I can't remember when it started. I, I obviously before the holiday, it, because we had production meetings every Wednesday uh, since I, I think right around Thanksgiving. I, I'm not sure, but and, and it got hotter and heavier as we as we closed in on this date. So they have gone above and beyond and 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 done a wonderful job, uh, and and my support. Uh, group here, which we'll talk about later, uh, has has been backing me up uh, as well. So all my all my guys, my board members. Uh, so we'll have more to say about that uh, a little bit later. So at this time, let's get back into our our rotation here, and let's go see where we're going next. So um, on my uh, and guys, I'm actually you see if you ever let me let you in on a secret. If you see my eyes go down, I'm looking at the script and seeing what's going on. So, so we've got this all laid out, but we never know what's gonna happen. But um, the next, next we're going to TCS, train control systems. So if I wanted to start from the directory, okay, then what's happening is I'm gonna, I'm gonna head down in that directory from the landing page, just so it's like, say, I guess I'm a trainer teacher, I, 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 it never stops. So I'm gonna head down to the T's and I'm gonna look for train control systems, TCS and tcsdcc.com. And then I'm gonna hit there and there's their website and you could log in or register. You could see it in English, you could see it in UK, uh, all kinds of things, guys. Main menu, you could pre-order. Now what's new and what's funny about this is I just was on a meeting with them with John uh, Forthight uh, uh, earlier in the week uh, was with uh, Train World and uh, they were talking about what's new and what's new for them is uh, this new line of throttles. Oh my God, you know, to see all of this. And we've got, I think we have a video coming up and if we don't, if it's not ready now, we'll get back to it because it's absolutely worth seeing or at least we'll show you uh, what's happening. But here's what I like about their website. When you go to their website, They've got some cool features. I love what's neat this week. It's, a, you know, it's kind of alliter alliterative, right? So it's like the buzzing bees and, 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 and all of that kind of stuff. But what's neat this week featuring TCS. So if you, and if you click on that, you'll actually see, but there's a bunch of them. And, 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 and again, back to that uh, discussion of where 
uh, uh, we were trying to gather all the clinics, there were just too many. And, and all of the information, all the new information and everything that's about them uh, is right there. Technical support is right there, right on the main, main screen, all that kind of stuff. But there's all kinds of um, wow diesel uh, features. Uh, and you can see the six new prime movers that they have. You guys, if you ever actually learned about what goes into the sound and they, these guys go out and record this stuff. It's like wild that they have to do all of this. So interesting what they can do. And if you've ever played with uh, train console systems um, uh, uh, firmware that's in the, in, the, in the software, it does some pretty crazy things. Uh, so let me see if we have um, uh, uh, that video. We're going to, we, we, uh, uh, we, 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 I think we have that link. So uh, let, let's give it a go and see what's happening, Mike. Go ahead and, and, and roll it. Let's go to the video. Everybody let's get happy. <laughs> Phones on silent, furnace is off. Yeah. Look at all those bright lights. By Intermountain Railway Company, where the detail makes the difference. Check out their website at intermountain-railway.com. The National Model Railroad Association, where membership has its benefits. Check out their website at nmra.org. Additional support is provided by TCS, Train Control Systems. Check out their high quality DCC sound decoders, throttles, accessories, and more at tcsdcc.com. Further support is provided by the NCE Corporation, the power of DCC. Visit their website at ncedcc.com. And thank you for supporting the What's Neat This Week podcast. This is the What's Neat This Week, show number 140 for December 19th, 2020. Merry Christmas, y'all. This is going to be the show that you all enjoy because we're all friends and model railroaders with that favorite great hobby that we all love, model railroading. And tonight we've got some great guests on Skype and in the studio. So rock and roll, starting over here, I've got... Sugar Fire, Joshua Barton What's with up, me tonight. What's up, everybody? Hey, Joshua. Hello. Also, you'll remember Ray Brown. Hi. That amazing modeler and 3D printing artist that you are. It's good to be back. We've also got Ray Brown's sister, Ashley Crisone. And the reason she's here tonight is because, Ray, you two have shared a lot of great model railroad, or actually prototype railroad yeah. experiences, and we look forward to hearing yep. from you on that. Out in Skype land tonight, from TCS, all the way on the East Coast, we've got Dan Missio. Hey, Dan. How's it going, everybody? It's going great, brother. I'm glad to have you on the show. Also, we here. have James Regeer. Hey, James in a Santa hat. Hi, everybody. Hey, James. Also, out on the East Coast, we've got Jerry Leone. Hey, Jerry. I I'm in Minneapolis, but that's the East Coast of something, I guess. Hi, guys. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> we Coast love you, Jerry. Jerry, you've gotten a lot of work done on your layout in a very short time. You're in your new house, and we can't wait to see you share that on the show tonight with us. Oh, I'm going to start out by saying we had our first snowfall this week, and it was very beautiful, although light. And as the snow was falling, I want you to direct your attention to the river. The river is very low, and the Army Corps of Engineers is out there working 24-7, digging it a little bit deeper with the dredge. That's what you see right here, all lit up like a cruise ship. It's very beautiful to see something like this on the river. And it sat out there for four days in, that, in the general area, because that's how long it takes to do about a half a mile of river. Um, what they generally do is they pump out the sand from the center current of the river and they try to keep it deeper so the barges will pass. And you can see on the end here the arm that goes out into the river. That's the fountain that's spraying all the sand onto the bank. I also filmed this in daylight so you all can see what it looks like because you know what? Barges are an important part of modeling too, especially if you're doing a river. And how cool would it be to model a dredge just like this? Absolutely. Really, really, cool. really neat. Those guys are out there working. And this is something that happens, you know, this is nothing new. This has been going on forever and ever, ever since they've had barge traffic on the river. And what do I mean by that? Let me show you a slide shot from 1968. 52 years ago, here's another dredge on the river in a photograph that my father had shot. And as you can see, this one's got a paddle wheel on the back of it. 
Not quite the clearest slide, but it's old, but it's really cool to see river history Classic. like that. Yeah. Because again, it's part of what we model. You've seen me model the towboat on the show and talk about that on various shows. Mm -hmm. And it's and my river section is also something that I very much enjoy because it's so cool to see trains go across those bridges like that. Another thing I want to talk about, I'm just finishing up with the February's What's Neat video. And Dan Schindel is our new uh, drone pilot that we have working with us. And he shoots some absolutely magnificent video. And in the February video, I feature some absolutely beautiful aerial shots of the big boy, 4014, running through Utah. Absolutely beautiful, and I wanted to share that with you tonight. Um, and so with that, guys, let's go out to TCS, out to Dan Missio, because Dan is gonna take us on an adventure tonight. Tonight we get to go on a field trip, and that's part of the magic of this show, is that we can sit back in our chairs, and we're going to Pueblo, Colorado, out to the National Transportation Safety Board testing facility, where they recorded sound for this amazing Bachman Charger locomotive that we've shown off a couple of times on the show. We've got it again on the table this evening, and this is one of the most outstanding models that has come out this year. If I were to give a model award for the best model of the year, this one would certainly be in the ranking. Absolutely. So Dan, go ahead and take it from here and tell us about where we're going to go and what we're about to see. Well, I take a lot of pride in the Charger, so I appreciate all those kind words. Um, yeah, the, the model is fantastic. They did a great job with it. And uh, I just wanted to share with you and your viewers a video that we compiled uh, of the Charger recording trip where we go out to Pueblo, Colorado. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and share that with you guys now. This is going to be exciting, guys. This is amazing what you're about to see, the amount of work that actually goes into doing this. Yeah, so um, it was really fun. I, I, one of my favorite things about the job is being able to travel uh, and, and go and see the country. Um, you know, there's, there's an ambitious uh, goal of mine to go outside of the country at some point. Um, and, you know, we may have the opportunity to do that. But getting out and getting to see the country has been super fun. Uh, getting to climb all around uh, all different types of locomotives. It's, it's really a childhood dream come true, it really is. And uh, I don't think there's any other job in the world that I'd feel happier doing. So it was a real pleasure to get out here, see these really cool sites, meet these really cool people. Um, you know, like you say, it's the best hobby in the world, the best people in it. And I haven't met a single person I haven't been able to jive with, which is amazing. Um, so a little bit about the facility that we went out to. Uh, like I said, it is in Colorado, just outside of Pueblo. And uh, this is a kind of secretive testing facility that we went to. And uh, so we were kind of limited on our abilities to record. We were not able to really capture a lot of uh, video footage. We weren't allowed to do any photography on the site uh, outside of our little building that we were allocated. Um, so you'll see wow. here some footage from the testing facility that they offer. Um, but, you know, typically when we go out, we record something, we've got, uh, you know, we're working on a short line, we're working on a, a class one railroad, and, uh, you, you know, you may have some limitations there, but it's not quite like what we had to deal with with these guys. Um, but, you know, we were still given two locomotives, and we were given full access to them by the facility to do our recording. Um, and here you can see we're all inside here. We got Larry from Bachman, uh, Larry Harrington from Bachman. We've got our, uh, our gentleman from Siemens who is helping us out there at the facility as well. And uh, it's really cool to see these locomotives when they're fresh out of the, the factory like this one was. You know, there isn't a speck of dust on it hardly. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, you, you look at like a, a vintage diesel and it's covered in, you know, uh, soot and you know, grease and all that sort of stuff. But this thing's fresh off the line. And when we got the models in, it's like, <laughs> yeah, wow. Look at that. So, right. yeah, one of the cool things they let us do with these uh, was we had uh, the number boards, or not the number boards, the destination signs. Uh, we figured out how to get into them and customize what they said, and we had them program one that said Bachman, and then uh, you'll see later on there's one that said Wow Sound. And we thought that was really cool, and Larry from Bachman actually managed to get two production samples one of which had the number or the destination sign say Bachman and the other one says wow sound and we actually have that model in our shop That's cool. all right so that was that was amazing we were real happy to get that together it's not it's a it's a real collector's item <laughs> uh, 
Um, here you can see some of our recording process. Um, on our recording trips, more recently, we've gotten a, a new special piece of equipment. It's a multi-track recorder that allows us to connect up to eight microphones at one time and do uh, simultaneously uh, recording of all those eight channels, but they're still independent. So we can use that to great effect for our editing part of things, while at the same time being able to capture a lot of different places around the locomotive and we can get all different kinds of sounds from. Wow, and, check this you know, out. We take those different things and mix them together. Um, one of the really cool things when we were out there was this little road runner you can see here running by. <laughs> so um, this guy didn't care, you know, he was like, you know, it was like a like a feral cat, but he didn't seem to mind us being there. You know, just going well, around doing this thing. And yeah, remember, always respect your local wildlife. <laughs> um, I think it was later in the day on the first day, we did have uh, a storm roll in, which according to the locals is something that happens maybe two times a week where uh, you'll get a rainstorm for about 10 to 15 minutes and it'll really come down. But after that, it you know just kind of uh, keeps on going, rolls on out of there. And uh, that's a little bit different than what you'll find on other parts of the country where it'll start raining and it'll rain for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. So that's been a, a problem with our recordings in the past where we've had to pack everything up and uh, you know reset things up the next day after it starts or after it stops storming but with this it was just a quick passing shower we took some of our more uh, sensitive equipment and put it back in the truck and then after the storm passed we got right back to it but so it's cool. really interesting to see this different type of weather all around the country it's very cool um, and uh, here you can actually see we were recording the, uh, the horn so we had a, a recorder that was you know, about 100 feet away from the locomotive, try and get some of that uh, reflective sound, some of that, uh, you know, off of the plains. It may not be quite the same as you might find in like a mountainous terrain, but you still get some good reflections and bouncing off of things. And uh, you get really good reverb, I'll tell you that. Nice. Mm -hmm. But obviously there's so many hours in the day, so we had to pack it in. Um, everybody went home and then we had our second day to go out and um, get back at it again. So we set everything back up, rolled them out of the shop, and uh, got back to it. Um, one of the things that I was very particular on when we were out doing this recording was making sure that we got every sound that this locomotive makes, and that every single sound that it makes finds its way into the model. So um, I think here we were setting up to record some of the different fans and uh, the air compressor that's located in this corner of the actual locomotive. And there's a there's a vent there that comes straight out of that area where you can hear a lot of the uh, blower noise from the brake grid fan, as well as the air compressor. And so it's stuff like that where we can use this recorder to position around in multiple different places uh, with our microphones, which are you know very good at picking up directionally. Um, and so we're able to capture stuff like that and reproduce it very accurate. Um, Something else that is more of a, a concern with, like when you have a lot of trees and stuff like that, and more so when we're doing recording in the east, is a lot of background noise. You can get sound from insects, you can get sounds from birds, stuff like that. Um, and in this instance, when we were out here, there was a bunch of birds that set up shop inside of the actual shop. And we had to actually close the, the bay doors so that we didn't get the reflections of those sounds into our recording. Yes. So we, we, with the accuracy of the... Hey, everybody, welcome back. And thanks, uh, uh, TCS, for that. Uh, and guys, that's a much longer video, by the way, but y you can go to their website and check that out. So next up is Scenic Express. And I've got a little, little backstory with this, guys. James Elster, Jim, is actually presenting uh, a clinic uh, given to us by Martin Welberg. He is actually from the Netherlands and he has a line of scenery product and a technique that's incredible. So when, when we watch this video in a second, I pay really close attention to the opening scenes. Because when I was looking at it, I'm going, is that a model? It, I mean, it is incredible. And this, so this, this, this video is all about how to use a flocking tool. Uh, and and it's, it's just amazing. And it runs about 29 minutes 
a little bit more, probably just shy of a half an hour. But let me give you the backstory with uh, Jim. So he's from just outside of uh, Greensburg, Pennsylvania. If you remember, that's where uh, John Brady's shop is from. But that's where my wife grew up, right? And I had mentioned that. But one town over, Jeanette, Pennsylvania, is where Elster uh, in that area uh, uh, is from. So I, were, I was heading down uh, to visit home uh, for my wife. And Jim says, come on over. And so I said, okay. So I go over and see his warehouse, which is unbelievable. It's 10,000 plus square feet of everything he does, guys. And I, I was blown away. But where he has a lunch for us, everything is really kind of cool. And, and, and the crew all comes in for lunch. They're all from uh, the same school that my wife went to. So, you know, Hempfield Township. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting around going, and I'm slowly getting left out of this conversation because it's like it's it's like a, you go into a, a reunion, a class reunion. I said, what? So I kind of like backed away and I went looking through the warehouse while well, these guys are having a class reunion. So that was my first exposure as visiting Jim down in his in, in his shop. So with that, let's let's go to <laughs> let's go. Remember Warner, I think it was Warner Wolf used to say on some New York channel, let's go to the videotape. So with that, let's go to the videotape, guys, and let's see Martin Welberg build a clinic. Guy, this guy's a hoot, and, and he's from the Netherlands, and, and we had to record it because live all the way across the sea from the Netherlands was a bit much, plus it's late at night for him right now. So uh, it's like seven, he's six hours ahead, so it's 7.30. But anyways, with that, let's check out this uh, clinic from Martin, uh, uh, Martin Welberg, guys, uh, remembering that... Uh, uh, Scenic Express is a platinum sponsor. So I really appreciate that, Jim. And Martin, take it away. Hi, I'm Martin and I own Martin Welberg Scenic Studios. I'm very pleased to see you all. This is the second time I have to skip the Amherst Railroad Hobby Show. Last year in 2020 I should attend for demonstrations in the Scenic Express booth, but due to a recovery after suffering an appendix surgery I had to cancel it. I discussed it with Jim and we postponed it to 2021, but this year we have other problems and we have to cancel our visit to the show unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately. Un Fortunately, something like that, because we're still living in the midst of this pandemic and with all the restrictions we have worldwide. I'm pretty pleased with the nowadays internet and the possibilities it has to stay in touch. And I'm very pleased that the Amazon Railway Society found a way to connect to you, the audience. Although I would love to see you in the flesh and have a chat about the greatest hobby in the world during a real life clinic or demonstration, I do believe that this is the way we connect nowadays and this is the best option in these hard times. But with the vaccine produced and more on the way, I have good hopes that you and I will meet and talk in 2020 at the Amherst Railroad Hobby Show. For now, I'm pleased to see you in front of a monitor or TV and watch the first clinic I do for the Railroad Hobby Show. This clinic or presentation will be about the fan scenery and modeling with the use of modern tools and materials. And now I hear you think, oh no, more computers and digital stuff on the way. But honest, no computers, no digital stuff. We discuss static applicators and vacuum cleaners and a bit about flock glue and other things. So in the first part, I will be talking about static grass. For me here in Europe, a technique already in use for two decades. To be honest, when I started modeling back in 2010 and not Grassmaster, now the 1.0 was, was one of the first modeling tools I bought. Now from what I understand, the recent introduced version, the 3.0 and the 3.1, have more power and more re reliability features than they used to have back then. But seeing Truals Kirk working on his layout with this machine, on his coastline railroad, I needed one of these to achieve the goals I had in mind and it's still a purchase I don't regret. And honestly I think 
that the static replicator is one of the must-have tools a train modeler needs. We use DCC, modern power tools and more to build our baseboards and run our trains. And then we did some foam or crappy colored sawdust on the layout to model our nature. The principle of flocking, as the static application is called, is all around us. The hood headliner in the back of your car, the flock boxes they put your jewelry in, you buy for your lady, and the nice soft fuzzy prints on t-shirts, you know, they are all flocked. Most with very short fibers but it's fiber flock in a glue base. Now I can tell you who introduced static application in modeling. As long as I remember there are these awful grass mats, 2 by 4 foot or something, with one color and one length, you know? But I can imagine one day a guy thought that it could be fun to use a static applicator he's using at his work on his layout. You know, we as creators often use materials for different purposes than mended to be for. But for us, you and me, it's not that interesting. The important part is what we can do with the static energy to achieve the most natural looking scenery on our layout. Okay, and what do we need to achieve results like this? Well, to be honest, I don't think that much. First of all, you need a static applicator, a machine to do the job for you. You need flock fibers or static grass in several colors and lengths a bit of water-based glue, a round beaten up brush and a lot of time. And yeah, 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 yeah. I can hear you say a lot of time, this precious thing we all lack. In my opinion, if you spend your time efficient, you can achieve a great natural looking result, almost like the real thing. So let's start and talk a bit about the applicator. There are a few on the market nowadays, a couple of them not available in the USA and some USA American brands not easy to lay your hands on in Europe. So for you guys over here I stick to the Static King from Woodland Scenics the one and only US brand I work with. I tested the Static King when I did clinics at the National Narrow Gauge Convention in Sacramento. So I can say that the Static King, especially when the wall power unit is used, works well and will do the job. What I use in the demonstration video is the Static King, because Jim sent me one. Well, I used a lot of machines in the 10 years I model now. I started in 2010, one of the first things I bought, but I said before, to use on my layout was the Nog grass mask. Well, according to Nog, it would provide 15 kilo volts of uh, static energy with the use of a 9 volt block but I couldn't reach the power they said it would be delivering 10 kilovolt maximum so I modified it a little bit and clipped it to a wall power power unit of 12 volts the wall power units pumped up kilovolts and boosted the charge well it was a bit of a gamble and it could damage the machine so it's not recommended because I posted an awful lot of pictures online of my work they noticed me and asked me if I wanted to become the grass master of a big project for 1000 square feet in Essen, Germany. So I traveled weekly to Oberhausen to work on this project and that's where the first time I laid my hands on a 70 kilovolt Mach Aeroflock. Well that is a device people, that is a device. It delivers 17 kick ass kilovolts of power and it is the turn of my life. I went on with static grass not only in the hobby but as a professional as well. Working in Germany I bought my, on my own 70k kilovolt unit. I had a follow up in the evening even more professional 80 kV units from Borgert and Muller. We have three now which we use in production. For all these years I tried, tried and yeah and tried even more and a lot of people started asking me, Martin, what is the best machine on the market? Well, do you need so much power? And all these kind of questions. To be honest, I will try and answer a couple. The first one, first question, what people ask me most of the time is, do you need power? My answer here is yes. If you start and buy one of these T-strain receive type of thing, I think that you will be disappointed when you try to shoot fibers longer as 2 mm. So I recommend a decent hobby grade machine that is at least 15 kV of static energy. Do you need more power? That depends on the scale you work in and what you intend to do and shoot with the machine. If you work in HO scale and you like to shoot mainly 2 mm fibers with some 4.5 mm accents, then a machine from 15 to 25 kV will be sufficient. If you intend to shoot a lot of 6 mm and 12 mm fibers, I recommend spending a bit more money and try to find powerful machines. RTS Screenkeep, which will soon be available through Scenic Express, produces good 35 and 55 kV static applicators. But if you have a bit more time, a course a mesh will work too. So here I leave it for now. Enough talk about machine. Up next is the main battle axe. My weapon of choice when it comes to creating realistic scenery with static grass is a round beaten up battered brush. Well yeah, it used to be a new one and I can hear you say nobody produces brushes like that and I must say you're right here. 
So one of the first things I will show you in this clinic is how to treat a brush so that it will be perfect for the job we intended for. I use a round brush with natural hog hair and you find it in my country in, for cheap in almost any dollar or hardware store. And these cheap brushes are perfect for what I have in mind for them. No need for expensive ones, just watch why. In the USA, this style paintbrush is available in a three piece set through Scenic Express. First of all, I take a bowl with water. clean tap water and ditch the brush or brushes in the bowl. And let it stand for a couple of hours. Most of the time it's an overnight process. In the meantime we search for a piece of leftover plywood from our layout build or some styrofoam we used for building our scenery. And also an old rack or t-shirt is an attribute we need. And for what do we need them? Well to dry our brush with the rack. All the water it's soaked up must be removed and then we start dabbing the brush on a piece of ply or styrofoam. Dabbing, smashing or whatever you would like to do but the brush needs to look like this. A brush with all the hairs widespread so they can handle small drops of glue to put down on the surface. That's the preparation of the brush. Now it's time to prepare our glue and I can hear you think do you need to and yes you do because of most of the ready made glues are not thin enough to let a glue drop run off the brush hairs you need to prepare you need to thin down the glue to a consistency of skimmed milk it has to flow easy so and what glue do we need well to be honest there are several glues you can use i myself use a pva school glue most of the time or an acrylic binder can you hear another question coming up an acrylic what? Well, an acrylic binder is a raw material they use for the manufacturing of acrylic paint. A pretty thick consistency, which can be thinned with water to the consistency we need it, but still has enough body to stick our fibers in with static energy. But I believe that any water-based PVA glue will work as long as it doesn't build up a skin too fast. Can I use a regular carpenter or craft PVA glue is a question that pops up very often. And the answer? And as an answer I say yes, no problem, as long as you keep the areas to work on pretty small. Regular carpenter or PVA glue does build this skin very fast and was designed for clamping materials you use. When you shoot static grass, we don't clamp and what happens is that because of the skin, the fibers can be shot into the glue. This upper surface is already dry and all the fibers bounce off. So what glues do I use? In the USA, glues like Elmer's School Glue or a glue all, Scenic Express Tacky Glue works fine much potch mat a matte medium concentrate don't know guess any pva or acrylic based glue that doesn't skin too fast will work we dilute it with tap water to a thin skimmed milky consistency and as long as it flows off the brush head pretty easy i don't know if i mentioned but your goal is to create a bunch of tiny droplets of glue on the surface where you will shoot your fibers in now i know that there is a bunch of manufacturers that sell an already mix you can use to glue your ballast to the layout and i can hear the question popping up well man martin does this work and i say no because of the addition of a flow weight it's designed to penetrate into your ballast it's gonna start to flow and as i mentioned before our goal is to create tiny little droplets on the surface well most of the time i use uh, big five liter cans a good one gallon jug in the US, but I can't determine how big your layout is and how much surface you will cover with static grass. Most of the time I prepare on site a good amount. Use 16 ounce to prepare a good 30 to 32 ounce of glue. Mixing a ratio of one part glue to two parts water makes a good solution depending on the material you use. Well, now you have your device, prepared your brush and glue. Time to move on and tell a little bit about the fibers. Often hear the question, what do you do to achieve natural looking colors? <laughs> What? You need to prepare the fibers? They don't come out, they don't come out straight out of yes and no. Straight out of the box, most fibers on the market are too bright. Some even have funny bright red and yellows between the greens. So what we do is mix them. Combine colors like pointillistic painters like Sarat did on camp on canvas. Combine a couple of colors to the point that it has the color of your liking. See it as pigments in paint. By combining red and yellow you have orange, yellow and blue, blue makes green. In fibers and olive, olive green and a beige makes a late summer. And how do I determine this color? Well for me that's pretty easy. I do it 
on site and I do it from memory. But for but my advice to most of you is that uh, that you take pictures or scavenge around the internet of these things you want you want or like to model and use this picture or pictures as a reference to mix your fibers on. Well, you, you put your fibers on a thing and, and look and check and you know, all these kind of things until it's reasonable the same. So let's try something for example. I downloaded the picture from the internet from what I would like to achieve on this Dutch modules and um, I think it's a late summer. So late summer for me in the basic is almost almost 50-50% of beige and a olive green. The olive green is the kind of green like uh, Mini Nature has in, 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 in stock. I think Jim from Scenic Express carries them too. I know Jim from Scenic Ex Express co carries this, this brand. They're pretty good and pretty nice fibers. And uh, we mix the two colors together in a bowl and um, most of the time I will vacuum it or shake it or something. So they mix good. Two millimeters you can shake. Four and a half and six millimeter and even longer fibers. I throw them through the Dyson to mix. So so what I say, yeah, almost a 50-50% of olive green and beige makes this late summer. And you check it on the on the picture. That's no deal. Uh, most of the time you add a bit of beige to tone it down. Uh, all colors I use are blended together from five base colors. I use a light green, an olive green, a beige, a brown and a reddish brown. The last two colors I mostly use for uh, winter or fall modeling. As you know yeah, in, in hot summers the colors will fade to browns, oranges, beige, all these dry colors. So we do mix colors, uh, we blend them together, uh, but we don't blend mix, uh, but we don't blend uh, lengths together. I stick in my layering with two millimeters, four millimeters and six millimeters, various colors in a blend, but not lengths. I do think Scenic Express offers perhaps the best range and color selection of static grasses in the USA. So for now on, I'd like to go on and talk a little bit about uh, how greens, grasses and weeds are layered. Since I do a lot of scenery modeling, I watch and look more and more to the real thing. You know, that is strange things happens, but yeah, I looked at women, I used to look at women and now I look at nature. I go out, take some walks, taking pictures, taking videos, all things that can, you know, all modern nowadays tools that you can use to create your reference material. Now from observation, I noticed that the first layers of grass almost all the time consists of a light green young undergrowth, almost like in spring, you know? And on top of that, you have this 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 layer of, of dead, these dead grasses, more bad stones dry toned well that is that's that's what you do in the first two layers you you model uh, of you you add uh, light green followed by a by a layer of, of beige and then on top of it comes the final color in which I like uh, to see the the, the, the layout uh, it can be um, yeah it, it can be uh, it depends on what you like to model you can change it start with the dry grasses uh, add some greens in between and more dread dry grasses on top if you like very dry very dry uh, very dry land very 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 dry land but most of the time I, I follow with, with the final color on top so and then the last thing we need before we start is uh, is a vacuum cleaner not that much to say I always use a uh, uh, Dyson because it has no dust bag the container comes in very convenient uh, but you can use a regular vacuum cleaner with a dust bag and put a nylon stocking over the hose to recover the loose fibers in the process they're pretty yeah for 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 the I think fibers are pretty uh, pretty expensive and everything you uh, you need uh, you can recover in your materials it comes in handy all the time yeah I don't know uh, something like that so now I think it's time to start we have our modules or layout with the raw scenery build I do use pink foam or XPS all the time because I love to work with this material. It has a different color over here, but most of the time it's it's called pink foam in uh, in the US, I think. And uh, almost all the time I cover it with uh, with sculptor mold just because of a little bit of a hard shell. The sculptor mold is painted in a, in is painted with a black brown or grayish brown flat latex paint. I think you call it in the US of A. It's a basic wall paint that they mix in any color at your do-it-yourself home improvement. Store. So with our base color on, we can start with the regular patches of glue. We use the glue we also prepared for the grass fibers and depending on the area we like to model. We add real soil or a fine 
turf in the earth color you like. I use a lot of scenic express flock and turf, very nice fine tones. And I prefer a fine earth tone like the natural earth EX857E, which I use a lot also in my uh, regular production. You keep in mind where you want your dirt roads and footpaths and after it's dry for most of the time overnight, After this is dry, and for me it's most of the time an overnight thingy, I do the same thing again and add uh, irregular patches of glue in between the patches of earth. And sprinkle a layer of fine turf of Scenic Express Khaki Green Fine EX826E, which is a faded green. I like it a lot and it represents for me the first layer of uh, mossy undergrowth. I didn't mention that in the story before. But underneath the spring colored grasses, the fresh young ones, there will be a mossy, depending on the area of course you model, a mossy thing somewhat, or there will grow mosses. So this uh, represents the first layer of moss underground. And again, yeah, we wait. Oh wow, well, man, waiting is something. Oh, I hate this as a modeler, waiting. You know, but we have to wait until it's completely dry before we can move on. So when it's completely dry, we grab our... Uh, well, now it's time to grab the static applicator, the pot of glue, the brush, and the two millimeter right light green spring mix we have. Take the brush, dry it, shape it as shown before, and dip it gently in the, in, in the, in the glue. You know, real gently, only the, the, the other tips, the ends of the, of the brush, the glue of the hairs, must be covered with glue. Now you dab it gently on the on the surface, but we like to cover our layout with static. Um, do it gently and keep in mind that everywhere the brush touches, also even if you don't see glue, there will be glue. There's uh, one mistake most people make and that is that uh, they think that static grass uh, needs a very thick layer of, of glue to stand up and add and adhere to. Even in the thinnest layer, the, the, the static grass fibers will stand up straight. If, if it doesn't, it's it has more to do with power of the machine than it has with um, with, the, with the static grass of with the glue. You know, it's it's just that some manufacturers try to think that try to tell you that you need their pretty thick glue to glue their their fibers to. Uh, the end result is most of the time, yeah, um, I call it uh, some kind of felt uh, tile uh, we use here as, uh, as, as as floor covering. So uh, what I mentioned before is that this uh, this fibers will stand in the, in the in the smallest drops of glue and all this kind of thing. So now I will mention and I will tell you not to don't don't try to to do too much surface at once you know keep keep it small yeah something like that and keep in mind that the static king works best when you close the so um when you did glue your your surface with with all these tiny drops of uh i know now with all these tiny drops of glue you take your static king you fill your static king you fill it with uh, with a two millimeter uh, spring mix. Yeah, you close the, uh, you turn on the sieve, put on the machine, and then start shaking. But keep in mind that the machines and all static machines work the best when you use a distance between the glue or the surface and the machine from around a half to one inch. So and so you shake, <laughs> rattle and roll, shut down the machine, put it aside. And then you wait again, easy, you know, easy peasy. Most water-based glues dry pretty fast, but not tough. So they have their final strength uh, after a, a day. But most of the time you can work on after 10 to 20 minutes. And after 10 to 20 minutes, you grab your vacuum cleaner and hover over the surface at the same height as you did with the static game. This will, will vacuum off all the loose fibers of the surface. This will vacuum off all the loose fibers on the surface. Well, this, no, this will get rid of most of the loose fibers laying around on the surface so that you can go and go, that you can work on. Um, now you have to decide if you go on and do uh, a larger part of your layout or you do the second layer on, um, on the part you already covered. It's pretty easy for the second layer. You have the same, you start, um, you know, well, it's, well, I do have to note something here and that is that you um, please m maintain a cleaning process for your brush in between and do that frequently. Uh, 
Um, this allows what, what Jim told me is weaken of the glue at the tips of the brush fibers and, and keeps your brush in shape like it has, you know, do it regular. So with all the fibers removed, you can go on to the second layer or do more on the layout, that's your decision. Again, we grab and dry and shape the brush. Clean, dry and shape is something we need to do often in between. It's a lot of work. I know, but uh, you have to because you want this small droplets. Again, dip the brush in the glue and dab it onto the surface of where you want your second layer. And you do that as random as possible. Add a little bit of glue on top of the of, of the fibers already existing on the on the. Again, yeah, just do it on top of the already existing layer. Again, tiny drops, not too much, not too not too thick. Clean and shape in between. Add glue. It's not that difficult, but you have to try and uh, and just do it. And please don't think too much about where you want to place it in these stages. It's more or less from oh well, it's, it's, it, it has to it has to be a little bit random. So while uh, adding glue, grab the static ink and add a, a layer of bash fibers. I know uh, bash sounds a little bit funny out of my mouth in English. I had a little bit of a problem with the word already. You wait a short time and then vacuum a gland. Uh, like to, like it's, it's the same like you did in the, in the in the first layer. And then, yeah, well, it's pretty easy, pretty simple. Uh, then you add your final layer of two millimeter fibers. Most of the time, this is in the color I like the I like them to be. So uh, if I want to model uh, late summer, I do this this faded green mix I showed you before. That's um, that for me it represents uh, late summer, and uh, because this final layer will give you the, the the final result and the final overall color. Yeah, you you do it again. It's, it's the same. It's the same process again. You know, um, you you use your brush, add, um, dip it in the glue, ditch it on the layout with tiny drops, grab your static king, fill it with, with fibers, shake them, and that's it. There you have your final layer of two millimeter fibers. You can use a daddy stone or uh, even mix uh, some, some more color in between. And in the mixes, uh, you to, to add slightly, change the colors and add more, more interest to the overall look. When you finish this layer, you vacuum again, uh, slightly, lightly, uh, on the same way you know you hover over the, the surface with uh, with a distance of, of uh, an inch, half an inch, and then you let it dry overnight. You know, when you let it dry overnight, it, it's, it's getting tough. Then you come on the next day, grab the vacuum cleaner and start vacuuming it very thoroughly. Yeah, get rid of all the loose fibers you have on uh, on, on the on the layout and why do we do that because that makes it easier to add m more layers of longer fibers so for me a minimum is 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 just one layer more in in ho scale one more layer of 4.5 millimeter fibers uh, most of the time i grab the color i uh, i used before that's the final color of the two millimeters in this case often um, I, I use often as a late late summer if you add these on top of the layers with uh, two millimeter fibers, it's it's just like uh, there are some slightly longer grasses poking out of the of the shorter ones. Yeah, you know, grasses can be very long. You know, they're they're growing in here in the Netherlands uh, along the highway. You have grasses and weeds growing over the uh, the safety uh, railing, and the safety railing is at 75 centimeters. That's around uh, somewhat more than two foot. So uh, and and they grow almost like a meter high. Uh, one meter, one meter twenty, so uh, four foot between three and four foot high. You know. Now this um, you can use and reuse and and try and work on this process. Uh, it's 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 time. Yeah, you can go on and do as much as you like and make your layers as dense as as, as you want to. The layers uh, not too dense. You know. Uh, at the end, it's it's more or less um, yeah the, the the layering that makes depth in. in in it. The only thing you do is that uh, that you, you think a little bit about where you want to add your longer fibers, you know. Um, most of the time just just check where they grow. Uh, you vary it with, with, with colors, fill the hopper, nice greens, bare stones, uh, whatever you want. It's not that easy. It's, it's not that hard, you know. So uh, for now I think I talked enough about static grass. I showed you uh, the most important technique I used to uh, achieve my my scenery. What I think the most important 
part after this with it to get more interesting views on a scene. You add weeds, you add bushes, you add all kind of things to make the complete scene more and more interesting to the viewer. There are several uh, materials on hand. Scenic Express carries the entire line of my products. I think they are great, as I say myself. But by using several weeds and bushes, you will get more interesting sections. You will get a more interesting overall look for the viewer and yourself, of course. What I um, well, I'll show you here in uh, in a couple of uh, uh, B-roll videos is how you uh, you add them with the drop of glue and where you add them. It's pretty hard to under to explain. I will do that in a, in the next video, I think. Um, so uh, for now, I think I uh, I'm gonna end this uh, this video. We already saw a shot uh, now for a lot of footage and just have to edit it. Please follow us on the Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get the notifications when new videos are online. We work hard to share our expertise and know-how to you, the audience, and let you create the most natural looking, the most natural and realistic looking scenery. So thanks for now, thanks for watching, and we'll see each other next time and hopefully here at the Amherst Railroad Hobby Show in their flesh. See ya, bye bye.